Welcome to the 13th Pfizer Colloquium of the Department of Statistics at the University of Connecticut. I'm Harry Poston, Project Director of the American Statistical Association's Project for the Filming of Distinguished Statisticians. Pfizer Central Research has provided support for this colloquium program since 1978, and this has allowed us to bring to our university the most distinguished scientists in the field of statistics. It has also allowed us to videotape most of these colloquia for the archives of the American Statistical Association. We are particularly grateful to Pfizer Central Research for this continuing support. Because of the importance of today's talk, we are again videotaping it for ASA's archives, and I will call upon my colleague from Yale University, Professor Peter Phillips, to introduce our distinguished speaker. As young people aspire to scientific careers, they're challenged and they're inspired by the senior scientists that have gone before them. The intellectual luminaries, if you will, that stand at the gateways to their discipline and light up its many paths. In statistical science, Ted Anderson is such a luminary. Ted's career spans the breadth of the American continent. His undergraduate beginnings in mathematics at Northwestern his graduate studies in statistics at Princeton, a year at the Coles Commission for Research and Economics at Chicago that proved to be an, of enormous significance to my own field, econometrics, 21 years tenure at Columbia, followed by another 21 years at Stanford, and the subsequent years since 1988 in retirement from the university, but not from statistics. 50 years, a full half century, of teaching and research. Throughout this long distance career, Ted's influence on the theory and the practice of statistics has been profound and far reaching. Wherever one turns in the subject, Ted's mark and influence are firmly established. His articles and his books have set him apart as one of the subject's finest communicators, one of its most original and rigorous thinkers. His work is the fountainhead of entire fields of subsequent research. His artistry is to make difficult technical matters appear routine, to attend to all the requisite details and yet never to lose sight of the substantive issues nor to lose his reader, to lead us out into new territory and make us feel as, as if we were walking in our own backyards. Ted's influence stretches well beyond the borders of statistics. His work straddles over statistics and sister disciplines of econometrics and psychometrics like an intellectual colossus. He has given these fields statistical methods to use where there were none before. He has helped them forge the tools they needed for their own types of experimental and empirical studies. He has written advanced texts in multivariate analysis and time series that have educated successive generations of statisticians, set new standards in technical exposition, and earned him a prominent place on the bookshelves of every statistician. In recognition of his work, he has received scores of honors and distinctions worldwide, yet all of these accolades lie in the shadow of his own scientific contributions. Those of us who've had the pleasure and the privilege of knowing Ted in person see a gentleman of humility and personal charm as well as an eminent statistician. It's truly an honor for me to introduce Ted to the colloquium on this important occasion. Through this medium, countless more may benefit from hearing his voice on statistics and sharing his special form of scholarship in this videotape lecture. Please join me in welcoming Ted Anderson. Well, thank you, uh, Peter, for this warm introduction. And thank you, Harry, for the invitation to participate in the colloquium. The uh, introduction that you just heard is quite in contrast to an introduction I had in Copenhagen several years ago. The chairman said, any presentation of Professor Anderson is entirely superfluous. <laughs> My uh, topic today is R.A. Fisher and multivariate analysis. R.A. Fisher was uh, uh, one of the 
perhaps the most eminent statistician, uh, a great um, uh, innovator in the field of statistics, and in particular in the field of multivariate analysis. Early in my career, I um, met R.A. Fisher in multivariate analysis in 1941, when I was a graduate student looking for a, a topic for a dissertation, my uh, supervisor, Sam Wilkes, suggested I read a couple of papers of Fisher, published in 1936 and 1938 on discriminant analysis. And I'll talk a little bit about that later in the lecture. I read the first paper without much difficulty, but then in the second paper, I ran into a lot of trouble. And I worked some time and tried to understand what Fisher was doing, and I finally gave up and decided I just would go ahead on my own and try to do what I thought he was supposed to do. R.A. Fisher was born in 1890 and died in 1962. At the turn of the century, multivariate analysis was uh, in its infancy, the uh, familiar moment, uh, product moment correlation coefficient was, um, was uh, defined by Carl Pearson in 1896, and then subsequently Ewell uh, um, introduced the partial correlation coefficient and the multiple correlation coefficient. So that was, in a way, beginning of, of um, what we now think of as, as multivariate analysis. The, um, the, um, the immediate, uh, I should point out that, um, that uh, the immediate stimulus to R.A. Fisher's work, which was a paper in 1915 when he was 25 years old, the immediate uh, uh, stimulus to him were two papers by student, the well-known uh, statistician. The first paper was on what we now know as the student t-statistic. The uh, student in this paper, student was interested in the uh, distribution of the, the small sample distribution of the ratio of the mean of a sample to the standard deviation of the sample. Student was not uh, exactly a, a mathematician. His way of, of, um, of uh, approaching the, the um, distribution of the mean and the standard deviation was to calculate moments. Now he was able to to mathematically calculate the first four moments of the sample variance. And he uh, also showed that the variance and the um, mean were uncorrelated. <clears throat> now at that time, uh, uh, the way of uh, treating distribution problems was to fit one of seven types of frequency curves that had been uh, formulated by Carl Pearson. And a uh, uh, student found that the Pearson type 3 distribution fitted the four moments that he had of the variance. And so he proposed that uh, this was to be used as a distribution of S squared, that is the sample variance. Now it turned out that he had hit the, hit the, the, the right button, that is uh, he had uh, the distribution, this type 3 distribution was what we now know as the chi-squared distribution, or really proportional to the distribution of chi-squared. <laughs> However, this was not a, a, uh, a uh, rigorous uh, proof. And this was what uh, Fisher was going to take up on. Actually, the distribution of the chi-squared had been found earlier by the German astronomer Helmert in about uh, 1876. 
And it's a little surprising that this was not known to the British statisticians since Carl Pearson had changed, had, had uh, studied in German, Germany for several years. In fact, he was so impressed by the German mathematicians that he changed the spelling of his name from C-A-R-L to K-A-R-L. The second paper that Fisher uh, was interested in, uh, also by a student in 1908, was the distribution of the correlation coefficient. And that's really the beginning of what I want to uh, talk about. Student uh, did a simulation study. This is, mind you, some uh, about 90 years ago. Uh, he, he did a, a simulation study for sample correlation coefficient for a sample size of four when the population correlation was zero and for a sample size of eight. Then he uh, calculated the first four moments of this statistic and fitted uh, another Pearson curve, Pearson uh, type two curve. And from this uh, form, we made a guess as to what the distribution of the correlation coefficient would be in general. That is, when the population correlation is zero, which is um, one minus r squared to the power n minus four over two. And again, he turned out that he had gotten the, the right answer, though by a, a curious uh, method. So this was when Fisher came on the scene. But I might mention one other paper that uh, preceded Fisher. That was by Soper in 1913, uh, which was published in Biometrica. This was a complicated paper and did not uh, uh, come to a very good conclusion. But Fisher wrote about this. To Mr. Soper's laborious and intricate paper, I cannot hope to do justice. And I shall not try doing that either. Uh, this was published in Biometrica, where Fisher's paper on the correlation coefficient was published in 1915. Uh, it turns out that uh, Fisher would read Biometrica at lunch. I might add as a little footnote that my friend John Tukey, when he started in statistics, used to read uh, back volumes of Biometrica's bedtime reading. Uh, Slide one. Now, the, the, in this uh, paper by R. A. Fisher in Biometrica in 1915, he, he found the distribution of the correlation coefficient by a rigorous fashion, but it was a uh, geometric method. So this paper is important in part because it was a, a, a rigorous uh, demonstration, and in part because it introduced his geometric method. So to start with, I want to consider the distribution of the sample variance, which was in this paper, and that introduces us to the geometric method that he used over and over again. So that uh, definition of the sample variance is given at the top of the, of the slide. So this is based on a sample of size n from a normal distribution with uh, arbitrary mean, say mu x, and a arbitrary variance sigma x squared. Now, uh, what Fisher did was to approximate the distribution of, he was going to approximate the joint distribution of the sample mean and the sample, sample standard deviation. So he considered a small interval for the mean and a small interval for the variance as indicated in the transparency by the quantity S star. And this is demonstrated in the figure at the bottom of the transparency. At the bottom of the transparency, you can think of this as a, uh, there's two parts to it. There's a, a tube that is two, uh, it's the uh, space between two two uh, spherical or s circular cylinders, that is, gives the inequality on the sample variance. And then there is 
a pair of planes which defines the inequality on the sample mean. So you can visualize this in three dimensions and you can imagine it in higher dimensions. The, in the, these three dimensions you see that the intersection of the cylindrical shell and the space, the slab I call it, between the two planes is a kind of a ring. Uh, if you wish, a kind of a donut, but a little more angular than that. Now, in getting the distribution, or getting the probability of x bar and s sub x to fall in this region, s star, the, uh, you need to calculate the volume of this intersection, s star. And you can see in the diagram that, roughly speaking, you take the circumference of one of those circles, and multiply by the thickness of the ring in one direction and the thickness of the ring in the other direction. And then you have a good approximation to the volume of that shell. And the result is indicated in the middle of the transparency. Of course, if you're in higher dimensions, you don't have this, the circumference of the circle. You have the surface area of a sphere. And so you get the radius raised to a power 2 less than the dimensionality times the two thicknesses. Now the next uh, transparency. The density of the observations, x1 to xn, is written at the top of the slide in terms of the uh, observations, the x sub i. And if you carry out the summations there, you find that that sum can be expressed in terms of the mean and in terms of the sample variance. And the, uh, the, uh, so then the probability of this uh, volume that we have talked about is the volume of that times the density, which is uh, a function only of the mean and the sample standard deviation. Now if you take that probability and divide by the dx bar star, the d sub s x star, and let those quantities go to zero, then you come out with the derivative which is the density function. And this can be made, this, I'm, I'm outlining the argument but it can be made completely uh, rigorous, though not analytic. Now one thing I want to point out here, and that is that this demonstration at the top indicates that x bar and s sub x are sufficient statistics for the parameters mu x and sigma x squared. Now this paper was written in 1915, and Fisher did not point this out because he hadn't invented the idea of sufficient statistics. But this is a forerunner of um, his later development of statistical inference. Now, some, this paper was published in 1915. Three years earlier, Fisher had apparently um, communicated with a student and student wrote to Carl Pearson at this time that he says, I'm closing, a, this is from student to Pearson. I'm enclosing a letter which gives a proof of my formula for the distribution of the, the, the T statistic. Would you mind looking at it for me? I don't feel at home in more than three dimensions, even if I could understand it otherwise. The question arose because this man's tutor is a keys man. Uh, well, this chap Fisher produced a paper giving a new criterion of probability, or something of the sort. A neat, but as far as I could understand it, quite unpractical and unserviceable way of looking at things. Parenthesis. I understood it when I read it, but it's gone out of my head. And as you shall hear, I have lost it. <laughs> Close parenthesis. You can make something of, of that, psychologically speaking. And then he goes on to uh, discuss uh, whether you divide the sum of squared deviations by the sample size or one less than the sample size. And he goes on to say, 
the tutor made him send me this explanation, and with some exertion I mastered it, spotted the fall fallacy, as I believe, and wrote hi him a letter showing, I hope, an intelligent interest in the matter, and incidentally making a blunder. To this he replied with two foolscap pages covered with mathematics of the deepest dye, in which he proved by using n dimensions that the formula was, after all, sum of squared deviations divided by n minus 1, and of course exposed my mistake. I couldn't understand this stuff and wrote and said I was going to study it when I had time. Actually, I took it up to the lakes with me and I lost it. <laughs> and later he wrote, since, dear Pearson, since I wrote to you, Fisher's first letter has turned up. It's nearly as incomprehensible to me as the other, but shows signs of supplying the missing links in the argument. I'm sending it to you in case it should interest you. Well, if you have trouble with the geometry and you're going to get a little more of it, you see you've had some company. Now, the letter, the paper in 1912 that the uh, student refers to is the paper in which Fisher introduced the idea of maximum likelihood. So this again was, th this I think is quite uh, amazing. Fisher was only 22 years old when he proposed the method of maximum likelihood. Now let's turn to the correlation coefficient itself. So the next slide. The definition of the correlation coefficient is given at the top there. We have a sample of pairs, x1, y1, x2, y2, and so on, up to xn, yn. These are taken from a multivariate normal distribution with uh, means mu x and mu y, variances sigma x and s standard deviation sigma x and sigma y, and a correlation of uh, rho in the population. So we have this uh, definition, and now we want to find the distribution of this quantity. So consider the set defined at the bottom of the transparency. This is a set in the space of the x's and the y's, so it's a, now a 2n dimensional space. And we again have a slab in the x part of the space, a slab in the y part of the space, and then an additional um, definition, r star, that's some fixed amount, less than or equal to r, that's the correlation that we're trying to find the probability of, and dr star, that, oh, that should be r star plus dr star at the bottom, that is, uh, we add an increment dr star to the r star. Now, we, we've already seen how to find the, the, the volume of the intersection of the slab and the cylinder sh cylindrical shell in the x space. Now consider the y space. So we want to find now a y, we want to find the volume occupied by y1 to yn, given an inequality on the mean y bar, given an inequality on the standard deviation, sample standard deviation sy, and the sample standard deviation r. So for a moment, consider the x part of this as, as uh, defined, and given that x part, want to get the volume of the, the, uh, the, the y space, in the y space. So that's indicated in a shaded area in that diagram. Uh, we are not taking account now of the y bar part. Now you notice that, that, that there's a, a circle. Well, there's two there's concentric circles, parts of them indicated there. One with, uh, with radius square root of n, s star y. That's, that's indicated in uh, space with uh, the, the brace. Uh, the, the, uh, this is supposed to be like what we saw in the previous one, but in addition, we have an inequality defined by the inequality on the correlation r. And this can be, uh, so this, this uh, can be translated into a, 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 this is defined by the angle between the x vector and the corresponding y vector. So the, the, uh, the volume here 
is well, we're, we're talking about the volume of a of a ring again a ring where the uh, cross section is uh, indicated up there in the shaded region and it it, it because the sphere and the, the um, cone defined by the R are, are spherical we have uh, again, a kind of uh, spherical donut where the radius is the sine phi star square root of n s star y. Now the point is that we can extend the, the geometry to get the volume of the space and that's given on the next transparency at the top. Uh, this is the volume of the y part of the inequalities and it depends on a radius raised to the power n minus 3 and a thickness and another thickness. So the idea is that the probability of this set s in the two-n dimensional space is the volume of that set times the, the uh, density of the observations. And in the next line, the second line, you will see that the density of the observations is a function of the, of the means of the sample standard deviations and the sample correlation. And again, I might point out that uh, this uses the idea that these five statistics are sufficient statistics for the five parameters, though Fisher does not say that in this, in this paper. Now once we get to this point, the argument goes along similar. Uh, we get the density by letting these differential quantities go to zero after we've divided to get derivatives. And the final step is to integrate the exponential part there with respect to the s sub x and the s sub y. And towards the next second from the bottom line, you see there's a, this is expressed as an integral. And um, Fisher, Fisher um, found that he could get an expression for this uh, essentially differentiating under the integral sign. Now the, the point to to my, my discussion is to illustrate uh, the geometric method that uh, Fisher used. And as he went along, he used the, this geometric method again and again, usually with less explanation than what there is in this paper. I might say, add that in this paper, he. he Fisher does uh, suggest the uh, uh, hypertangent, the inverse hypertangent uh, uh, transformation, which is uh, turned out to be a very useful trans transformation. Also in this paper, he suggests that as an estimate of the population correlation rho, it would be good to use the value of R, R star that maximizes no, the value of rho that maximizes the density given the observed value of R. This is what we know as the method of maximum likelihood. And he referred to his paper in 1912. Well, this uh, caused some uh, controversy. Actually, this paper was published in Biometrica, of which Carl Pearson was the editor, and he added a, a, a little note after the paper, making some comments, suggesting that uh, uh, you really needed some large sample theory, that you shouldn't use the correlation coefficient for sample sizes less than, than 10. Uh, Pearson also studied the distribution of the, of the correlation coefficient and uh, published a paper with Soper, Young, Cave, and Lee in 1917. The Pearson thought that Fisher's recommendation of the most likely value, that is the maximum likelihood 
value for, for the estimate that that was an application of Bayes' theorem. I guess I should be careful here at, uh, at uh, stores, which uh, seems to have a number of uh, practitioners of uh, the Bayes' theorem. The, the, uh, in this paper with five authors, they devote about eight pages to discussing the use of a uniform prior for Rho and criticizing its use. Now Fisher was, was upset by this because he wasn't thinking in terms of Bayes' theorem. He was simply using the, the density function in order to define an estimate. In his next paper, Fisher responded to this criticism. He submitted this paper to Biometrica. And uh, eventually, he got this uh, letter from Carl Pearson, the editor, saying, as there's been a delay of three weeks already, and as I fear if I could give full attention to your paper, which I cannot at the present time, I should be unlikely to publish it in its present form, or without a reply to your criticisms, which would involve also a criticism of your work of 1912. I wish you would publish elsewhere. Under present printing and financial conditions, I am regretfully compelled to exclude all that I think erroneous on my own judgment because I cannot afford controversy. As a former editor, I appreciate that um, phrase, I would prefer you published elsewhere. It's a very um, oblique way of giving the decision. Now, it turns out that, that Fisher had had two other papers rejected by Carl Pearson on somewhat similar grounds. That is, on the grounds that if, he, if Pearson published Fisher's paper, he would have to write another paper. That is, Pearson would write a paper in which he showed that Fisher was wrong. <laughs> so, uh, uh, the guy, just to quote another letter, he says, under present pressure of circumstances, I must keep what little space I have in Biometrica from controversy, which can only waste what, what power I have for publishing original work. So, needless to say, Fisher published in other journals after that. The next paper, the paper that I am really referring to, was published in Metron and had to do with the distribution of the correlation coefficient in the interclass model. That is the model where you assume that the means of the x and y are, this are equal and the mean, the standard deviations of x and y are equal. In this paper, he criticizes the comments by the authors, the five author study, the cooperative study. Fisher wrote that they enforce the prior distribution with such rigor that a sample which expresses the value 0.6, that is r equals 0.6, has its message so modified in transmission that it is finally reported as 0.462 at a distance of only 0.002 above the value which is assumed a priori to be most probable. Now Fisher thought that was relying too much on the, the uh, prior distribution. Now, Fisher uh, had another paper on the partial correlation coefficient and showed that if you take, use deviations from the regression on a third variable, you get the same distribution with, with degrees of freedom decreased by one. Fisher uh, had been criticized for using the geometric method of, of deriving distributions. And uh, he, uh, Fisher wrote a, a paper on various uses of the chi-square, the t, what we now know as the f distribution. This was in 1925. He uh, writes, Fisher writes, it is perhaps worthwhile to give at length an algebraic method of proof, since analogous cases have hitherto been demonstrated only geometrically by means of a construction in Euclidean hyperspace. And the validity of such methods of proof may not be universally admitted. So Fisher wants to um, 
justifies some of the techniques used in the analysis of variance. Well, he says if you have n, y1 to yn are independently normally distributed with mean 0 and uh, ver standard deviation 1, if you make an orthogonal transformation to some z1 to zn, then the resulting z's are also independently normal with mean 0 and variance 1. So then he went on to argue, so suppose now that the first h of the new variables, the z's, have been defined. Then he says you can find definitions of the other n minus h to complete the orthogonal transformation. And then the sum of squares of the first h have to be independent of the sum of squares of the last n minus h, because the they're sums of squares of, of variables that are themselves independent. And this was his argument, for example, that, uh, uh, that uh, if you take the, the uh, well, the argument was that the sum of squared deviations from a fitted regression is independent of the the uh, estimates of the of the regression them, themselves. So this uh, this was Fisher's way of essentially justifying the independence of quantities and the analysis of variance as well as in other kinds of regression analysis. About uh, about a decade later, Wishart gave a paper in the Royal Statistical Society about uh, uh, it had to do with 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 um, independence of quantities in the in the in the analysis of variance and uh, Wishart referred to a paper of Irwin in 1934 well Fisher thought that that uh, Wishart really should have cited his 1925 paper that that was all that was needed and when the paper was finally published, that was indeed the way it went. Well, I mention this because uh, at Princeton, at one point, Wilkes told me about uh, another facet of this. Wilkes was in, in London in the year 32, 33, and spent some of the time with Fisher at Rothamsted. And Wilkes thought that there ought to be a, a better, ought to be a more complete proof of the independence of quantities and the analysis of variance. So he, he wrote a, a paper doing this in a, in a rigorous analytic fashion, submitted it to the Journal of the Royal Statistical Society. Uh, it was rejected, and it was clear that the referee was Fisher. This was before Irwin's paper was published, which was the one that was referred to, to by Wishart. So Wilkes' paper never Never get, did get punished, and never did get published since uh, uh, after being turned down by the Royal, Journal of the Royal Statistical Society, he gave up the publication. Well, let me just turn briefly to one other of uh, the correlation coefficients. Let's have the next slide. The multiple correlation coefficient. So we have a single variable, little y and uh, q independent variables x1 to xq and now the diagram there is in n-dimensional space there's a vector for x1 x2 and so on a vector for y when you take the regression of y on the x's geometrically you're projecting uh, y orthogonally to that uh, hyperspace of q dimensions and that's the vector capital y and the multiple correlation coefficient is the cosine of the angle between the observed y and its projection. Now Fisher points out that if the population multiple correlation is zero, that is if y is really independent of the x's, then the direction of y is uniform over the unit, the unit sphere in the n-dimensional space. And he says, using this fact, it may be shown without difficulty that the chance that r squared falls into the elementary range dr squared is, as given in uh, 
lower part of the transparency. That's his entire proof, which you see is rather, rather sketchy. Uh, now, we would, we would, in my multivariate book, I show what's at the bottom of the page, namely that the ratio r squared over 1 minus r squared is related to an F statistic. And this can be put into, into geometric terms. The, this is in the case of no correlation in the, in the population. Uh, let me look at the next slide. If, suppose that, that one uh, now has a multivariate normal distribution in which y is related to the, to the x's, then what Fisher did was make a transformation to a canonical form and use the same kind of argument that he used before, that is a, 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 the end result of which is a, an integration but he has to use still another argument to relate that uh, correlation be with, with, with the multiple correlation coefficient. He uses a, an ingenious argument that uh, involves the, the, uh, the uh, partial correlation between uh, the y variable and one of the x's uh, given the value of the projection capital Y. Well, I don't have time to, to go into that uh, in, more, in more detail. Let me turn now to some other uh, topics in, in multivariate analysis. The distribution of the correlation coefficient essentially amounted, involved finding the distribution of the two sample correlation coefficients and the sample covariance the sample uh, correlation. Wishart, 1928, generalized that. Uh, let's see, we have the next. You know, we have the next slide. Uh, so consider the matrix capital A. This is now a, a, a p by p matrix, and the uh, you see what in um, Fisher's derivation of the correlation coefficient, he first considered one variable, and those terminology the x, and then he considered the second variable y. In this paper, Wishart considers a third variable z, let's say, and gets the joint distribution of these quantities where x, y, and z. And this is using the geometrical argument of Fisher again, and then, he con then Wishart concludes that the general result is given as in the second line in this transparency. In, the, uh, in, the, in his paper, Wishart writes, my thanks are due to R.A. Fisher, in whose laboratory this paper was written, and without whose critical help it would have been difficult to generalize the geometric methods employed by him. So that suggests that Fisher had a, a considerable hand in this derivation using the geometrical method. It seems that, uh, that uh, most statisticians uh, were working together with Fisher at some point or other. I've mentioned Wilkes and uh, Wishart. Harold Hotelling worked with Fisher at Rothamsted in 1929-30. This was just before he developed the uh, Hotelling's T-squared, which is generalization of the student T-statistic. And this is defined in uh, the transparency. As you, you see, there's a little misprint there. Uh, and uh, Hotelling, Hotelling managed to transform the statistic T squared to make it look like the, the cosine of the angle between a coordinate axis in the n-dimensional space and the hyperplane that's defined by the 
the vectors x1 to xp, you remember the previous uh, diagram that we had. And then he made an argument that if, uh, that if, so in this case you have a fixed single axis and you have a random uh, hyperplane defined by, by uh, p vectors, that you get the same, uh, for as far as the distribution of the angle goes, you get the same result as if it's the single vector that's randomly distributed and the other vectors are held fixed. So this was back to Fisher's argument for the multiple correlation coefficient. However, the difference is that Hotelling wrote this out in terms of um, in, in, in terms of spherical uh, spherical coordinates, and and uh, actually carried out the integration. So he carried out analytically what Fisher had waved his hands, arguing as I as I mentioned before. Right, let me turn now to, to a, 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 a different subject. As I mentioned earlier, uh, Fisher published a paper in 1936 on discriminant analysis, first paper that I read and understood. So let me uh, describe that. It's on the top of the slide there. We have two samples from multivariate normal distributions. We define the mean of each and the difference of the means, mean vectors, is a vector d. We take the sum of squared deviations within each sample, put them together, divide by the degrees of freedom to get an estimate of the covariance matrix, uh, matrix S. Then Fisher said, let's consider an arbitrary linear combination, B prime X, and uh, consider the mean of that in this, these samples and the variance in the samples and then find the linear combination that maximizes the difference relative to the standard deviation. So that's considered in the next to the last line. And it turns out that that is just proportional to a t-squared statistic defined for the two-sample problem. It's interesting that this uh, this uh, discriminant function, this, this statistic, came up from, from uh, uh, R.A. Fisher's discriminant analysis. It came up from Hotelling's t-squared. It also came up from Mahalanobis distance squared, which is given at the bottom of the page. Mahalanobis defined this in terms of the population quantities. And uh, subsequently, uh, uh, his colleagues uh, R.C. Bose and S.N. Roy studentized it, that is, put in estimates and found distributions of these, of these, uh, the estimated d squared, which of course was the same as, as the hoteling t squared. Fisher wrote about this. He said, in a very brilliant research, Bose and Roy have determined, demonstrated the distribution of d squared. <coughs> Incidentally, uh, R.C. Bose told me once that it, when Fisher visited India in 1937-38, Bose and, and Roy wrote up the lecture notes of Fisher, and they found some, well, some gaps, so they filled in these gaps in the proofs. They sent the manuscript to Fisher for his uh, approval, and the manuscript kept, came back, and all of the additional proofs that they had put in had been crossed out. So Fisher knew what he was doing. Uh, okay, let's go on to the next slide. So in this case, we have Q, uh, Q samples with means as indicated at the top of the page, and there's an estimate of, of the covariance matrix from the pooled, and uh, you'll see uh, further down, a matrix capital H, which is the um, sum of squared deviations of the sample means from the pooled mean. So these are the quantities. The H and the A are the quantities that we get in the multivariate analysis of variance. Now, effectively, what Fisher was 
wanted to ask the question, is it reasonable to think that the means of these Q different populations lie on a line? I mean, first we might ask the question, do they lie, are they, do they, do they coincide? Secondly, if they don't coincide, do they lie on a line? So his, his, um, his uh, proposal, Fisher's proposal, was to consider the determinal equation that's more or less on the middle of this transparency, the determinant h minus the unknown theta times s equal to zero. And then he proposed that you would reject the hypothesis of collinearity if the sum of the p minus 1 smaller roots was uh, larger than some suitable number. So if the means lie on a line, you expect the largest root to be different from 0, but not the other roots. Well, this was a paper that I mentioned at the beginning of my lecture that I had trouble understanding. This paper was reprinted in a volume called Contributions to Mathematical Statistics in 1950 that consisted of some uh, 25 or 30 papers of R.A. Fisher with introduction by Fisher and with annotations. And in this paper, as published in the volume Contributions, at the part at which I had difficulty understanding, it was crossed out, and the rest of the paper was crossed out, and something else had been put in its place. The reason I couldn't understand it was it was wrong. <laughs> so Fisher admitted in public, at least in that case, that what he had originally published was incorrect. This, as I mentioned, really got me going on my dissertation. And among other things in my dissertation, I showed that the likelihood ratio criterion for this hypothesis of collinearity was a function of the p minus 1 smallest roots, though it was a different function what, what, uh, what uh, Fisher proposed. Now, the, the, uh, this, this uh, problem suggested the, the problem of the distribution of roots of determinal equations. We had the, the one determinal equation, um, determinant h minus theta uh, a, theta s, equals 0. Uh, so you have two Wishart matrices. They're independent. You ask for the distribution of these roots, the characteristic roots of one in the, in the metric of another. Well, it turned, Fisher published a paper on this, but turned out there were at least five statisticians that were working on this at the same time. In the Annals of Eugenics in 1939, Fisher published his paper. It was actually uh, only for either p equals 2 or p equals 3. P.L. Hsu had the next paper in that issue in which he gave a, a, general, um, a, a general derivation. S.N. Roy published in Shankya, also 1939, but because of the war, that didn't show up in, in, in England or in the United States until uh, much later, also had the distribution. Uh, M.A. Uh, Gershik published a paper in the Annals of Mathematical Statistics, also 1939, essentially in which he got the distribution. Unfortunately for, for uh, Gershik, he was a PhD student at Columbia, and Columbia had the rule that you couldn't uh, publish, you could not use as a dissertation a paper that's already published. So uh, this, this uh, paper by uh, Gershik could not be used as a dissertation topic. But there was somebody else who was also disappointed, namely Alex Mood. Mood was a a, a, a student of Wilkes, and he was working on this problem for, for a, a dissertation. 
And I remember Wilkes telling me about this, this uh, incident that uh, Mood was working on, on, on this distribution. And just at the, at the time, he was ready to, he was almost ready to, to complete the study. And then the paper by, by, uh, papers by Shu and, and Fisher King. Well, I, I, when I was an editor of the Annals of Mathematical Statistics, I, I uh, uh, persuaded uh, Alex Moog to publish his version of it because he had a different way of deriving the, the result. The last paper of R.A. Fisher was published in 1962, which was the year of his death. And that was a paper, again, on the distribution of correlation coefficients. His objective was to find the distribution of the, the whole set of correlation coefficients, given essentially the Wishart distribution of that matrix A or the matrix S. Uh, he did not really complete that, that problem. He gave an expression, but not, not a, 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 a fully, a, a, it was a, what should I say, it was not an explicit uh, distribution. It was, it was mm. just implied by the mathematics that he was doing. So to, to uh, conclude, R.A. Fisher, throughout his career, developed multivariate statistical analysis. He was very large figure in, in um, not only the, the presenting the ideas of multivariate but analysis, but in carrying out the, the analysis and uh, developing many of the important concepts and uh, distributions that we use today in multivariate statistical analysis. Thank you, Ted, for a very good presentation of a difficult subject, multivariate analysis. This concludes our 13th Pfizer Colloquium.